Okay. My, my boat would fill a Harker's Island. Oh, okay. Well, let's get Clean to well, let's, let's get to that in a second. But first, I just want to say that my name is Barbara Garrity Blake, and I am here talking to Mr. Charles Meekins in Stumpy Point, North Carolina, on January 26, 2016, as part of the Coastal Voices Port Light Project. So thank you, Mr. Meekins. Thank you. So you were just telling me that your boat was built on Harker's Island? Yes, Clan Willis was a carpenter. Clem said he'd never done anything in his life except build boats and dig clams with his toes. Wow. He was a good boat builder, but I think Clem's dead now. I think so, too. Well, tell me about your boat. Oh, there she is. Yeah. It's a model. How many foot feet is that? The boat was 32 feet long. I, I, I had it built in 1972, and I quit work about 19... Oh, about 2012. Mm -hmm. And the man worked with me for 17 years. I sold him the boat for a dollar. Really? Yeah. Oops, what was the name of the boat? I'm going to hold this up. It didn't have a name. Uh -huh. I wanted to name Empty Bucket. My wife said that was a poor confession. I said, well, I'll name it Rock and Roll. She said, I don't like that. But I said, well, you pick one. When you decide, we'll name it. She never decided. I never named it. Wow. So you had a nameless boat. I had a nameless boat. That's unusual. Yes, it is. But I had a good wife. It just took her a while to decide on a name. <laughs> I had her 53 years. Mm -hmm. I found a secret. What was that? <clears throat> never complain. Give her a checkbook and do like she says. There you go. <laughs> she worked a week during our, during our lifetime. Earned two hundred dollars. Said at the end of the week, I don't like this job. I said, well, honey, quit. We she quit. She stayed home, raised two beautiful girls, took care of me, learned to be a really good cook. Mm -hmm. That's about all I ever needed was a good cook. Yeah, well, that sounds nice. Can you cook? Um, <clears throat> I still need a good cook. <laughs> My husband does most of the cooking, actually. Well, uh, I'm lucky that way. I'm not interested in the sex. I can take a man. <laughs> I just like to have a good cook. <laughs> Gender's not important. Okay, I'll see if he has any time to come up here. That'll work. So, Mr. Meekins, can you tell me a little bit about when you were born and where you were born? I was born in that front bedroom. Mm -hmm. March, right here in Stumpy March Point? March the 12th, 1933. March the 12th, 1933 in Stumpy it Point. It was a cold Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And I was really chilly. I was naked. <laughs> <laughs> My mother had a twin sister. She said she was coming from church. Said she could hear her mother screaming from the road. I don't know what she was screaming about. I was getting along fine. So you had a midwife deliver you? I did. Do you know who she was? Well, I did know. It's been a, a while ago. I knew she was from High County, and she was a small black lady, and, and she delivered several children here at some point. Well, I forget the name now. Hmm. I feel like she's probably going on. Probably. If she's not, she needs to. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like growing up here in Stumpy Point? It was better. Everybody was friendly. Everybody had a gun. Nobody shot each other. We all got along well. Everybody my age, a little older and a little younger, were my friends. And they still are. What well, few of them are left. Yeah. And was there a school in Stumpy Point? Yes, there was a school here. And uh, I went to school here first and second grade. Then we had a world war. Went to Norfolk for four years. Then I come back and, and went through the 11th grade. And then the state decided they wanted to consolidate the schools. And with 
didn't have a bridge across the road and sign, sent, sent us to Englehart, graduated in Englehart. Okay. About four or five years later when they got the the bridge across sign, they sent the students to Manio. Why did you go to Norfolk for four years? Everybody here worked in the war effort. Did your father, or were you old enough to do it? No, I was only eight years old. Okay. My father worked in the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in the, car, in the uh, boat building shop. He worked on any kind of boats, from whale boats to minesweeper, that were built out of wood. <laughs> and my mother worked in the sheet metal shop. She built lockers for ships. And everyone worked in the war effort. There was only eight or nine families left on Summit Point. They all were in the war effort. Was your father a boat builder? Not really, but he built boats. He was a fisherman, but he built boats on the side. Mm -hmm. He built anything out of wood. He built a lot of his house. He was a young man then, about and, 25. And what year was this built again? 1928. Wow. And here it is up in the air now, yeah. looking like new because you had to get the whole thing refurbished and raised. Everything in, in this house was thrown out. Mm -hmm. Everything downstairs, every, all this furniture you see is new furniture, except the TV and these tables. These tables were wood, so they didn't, the salt didn't ruin the table. Just cleaned them up. But all the couches and chairs and what the TV is sitting on, Mm -hmm. it's, it's new because TV stand for was ruined. And everything in the back had all the electrical stuff, refrigerators, freezers, all that stuff. How many times and how many times has this house been flooded over the? Once. Really? Four years ago. Four years ago. Irene. But, oh, Irene! I was thinking Isabel that whole time. Uh, no, none of the other hurricanes have ever come in this house. Wow. Why do you think Irene flooded? Well, we had, we had about a, a foot and a half more water than Irene than any other storm. Okay. This is south, and that's where our bay opens up, and the wind was blowing right straight into the bay. Well, it blew there for maybe two and a half or three days before the storm got here. So that when the storm got here, the tide was already high. And then when the storm got here, it stopped. And it blew for up like 24 hours. And the water can't get off. Our inlets are closed. There's no runoff much. And it just kept getting higher and higher and higher mm -hmm. until we were flooded. It, it looks like everybody got flooded. There was only two or three houses on some point that were not flooded. Only two, except the ones that had had already previously been raised. So, um, did FEMA come in and help pay for the... They might have helped some people. They didn't help me. Really? We did get a little bit of free labor from uh, various organizations, but um, I didn't get much. Because it's expensive to lift a house. Yeah, it is expensive. Well, you know, my insurance paid me $30,000 extra to the policy just for raising the house. If our expenses, because of the flood, is 50% above the tax value, our insurance will pay us $30,000 to raise the house. We pay premiums on that every year. Mm -hmm. Well, it's remarkable that a house this age only got flooded four years ago. That's incredible. Well, when this house was built, material was better material. You can't buy hard pine lumber anymore. And all the seals and rafters and floor joists in this house are hard pine. And they'll last like forever. Mm -hmm. So your father was a commercial fisherman. He was. All of his life. And what did you do for a living? I fished for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you followed in your father's footsteps? 
Yeah. My daddy didn't want me to fish. My mother didn't want me to fish. But I practiced fishing when I was about four or five years old, playing in the ditches and killing minnows and playing with boats. And I grew up on the water, and that's what I always wanted to do. I spent four years in the Navy. Probably would have stayed, but my mother had cancer, and they said she was going to die, and I wanted to come home. But she lived until I was 50. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I had three or four job opportunities, but I just hung in with fishing. Has it been a good life? I've enjoyed it. What do you like about commercial fishing? Well, I don't have to answer to anybody but me. I don't have to go to work if I don't want to go to work. I always worked hard. I was really lazy, but I had to work hard because my girls were expensive. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I wanted them happy. And my wife didn't work except in the house, so I had to work. What kind of fishing did you do? I did it all. Pound net? I did fish pound nets. Mm -hmm. Gill net? Yes. Long nets. Mm -hmm. Shrimp nets. Mm -hmm. Flounder nets. Crab pots. Trawl boats. I did it all. Who built your nets? I did. Wow. I didn't build all of my trawl nets. I built most of my shrimp nets. You know, if you do things on yourself, you can have it like you want it. I don't know that my nets are any better, but they're the way I wanted them. So I made most of my nets. We ordered our pound nets, but we had to hang them. They would come put together, but no rope or weight or stuff. Mm -hmm. We had to make them. And we made all of our gill nets, top and bottom. Hmm. My daddy and I hung our nets. I never made any crab pots. I bought my crab pots. Who'd you buy your crab pots from? Various people. I bought most of them from Mayo's Commercial Fishing down in Scranton. Mm -hmm. But I bought some from Mary Ellen over in uh, New Lake. and That was about it. Not many people make crab pots. Yeah. Now how about selling your fish? Who, who did you sell to? Well, I sold most of them to the Fisherman's Exchange when I was pound netting. He went out of business along about 72 or 3, and then I, I started selling to various dealers. I long it for about 15 years. Do you know what a long net is? Well, is it like a long haul net? Yeah, it's does a it, long haul net. Does it take two boats? Yes. Okay. Cause four they, men. Okay. Unless you live in Carteret County, it takes six men. Yeah, why is that? That's what I was wondering. Well, they do it differently than we do. Okay. So how is it different? How do you do it? Well, they use three, two crews, three men in each crew. And their net is in 200-yard sections with a pole or a staff on each section. And they're tied together. And they start in deep water and pull it up to a shoal. And then they pull the end of the net together and stick those two staffs down. And then one crew will go on one side of the long haul net, one crew will go on the other side. And they'll take 200 yard section up in a skiff. The boat will pull the net along and take up 200 yards and stop. Then they'll go back and take up 200 and they'll pull that bump up the shallow water. Then they'll get overboard and Mm -hmm. and put it in a little circle until it butt the fish up in a tiny circle let them in the boat. We don't operate like that. How do y'all do it? Well, we only have four men so we can make more money. And we don't pull up to a show. We butt in deep water. We butt in where we want to. Mm -hmm. And when we come together, we put three men in the skiff. We already have two in there have a man in each boat, and the boats come together in a circle. One man will stop his boat, anchor, and get in the skip. We have a little runabout. He can get in the runabout and go to the skip with the other two men. And then the boat's tied on the net, and he just pulls that net in a circle, about two circles, and they pull the slack in the skip. 
And then we have a method of buttoning it. Okay. It's hard to explain. If you saw it, you wouldn't understand it. Yeah. Okay. We've had people to go with us to observe it. When they were finished, they didn't know any more than they did when they started. <laughs> it's just something you're born with or you learn how to do it. Right. But we've done it anywhere. Can you tell me about the, what was the Fisherman's Exchange? Was that a, a fish company? It was a fish house. Mm -hmm. I had a picture of the fish house, but my daughter had hid it somewhere. It stayed on the table. It burned down during the 50s, the early 50s. Was it in Stumpy Point? It was. Where the new bridge is, when you first come in the point, and some point from Ingard, where the water is, on the right, it was right down the edge of the bay. Okay. And it was a large building. And I, I wish I had the picture, but I don't. my daughter don't like the thing to be scattered, so she hides everything. <laughs> well, there's a couple fish houses there now. Looks yeah, like. well, they're not, one of them is my neighbor's, but he doesn't buy anything. Was that Trinity? The Trinity is not not operating. Okay. I think it's going to soon be operating. Uh, two doors over, Luke Midget owns it, but he's not started buying anything there. The fish we've changed bought mostly pound net fish. He was in operation before I was born. Mm-hmm. And it, it burned down somewhere between 53 and 57 when I was, was in the military. And he built the one the Saturday now, this way, that's old and about to fall down. Okay. So, Mr. There's, there's not a fish house here. No? Mm -hmm. So, what do these fellows do? Well, they haul their crabs and pick up trucks somewhere else, and nobody here fishes. Fishing's about died out around here. There's so many rules and regulations that most of the fishermen had to quit. So, they're mainly crab potting? Pretty much. When they got down to just crab pots, I quit. I didn't like crab pots. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of limited. It's pots full, it's not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. All that don't get full. Yeah. It's a circle, a third of a mile in diameter, and you can't fill it up. Why? What, what happened? What happened to, yeah, I mean, to the fishing? Mm hmm. Well, we had to quit fishing on the kind of uh, rules that the marine fishers made. I wasn't allowed to have but a hundred pound great trout, and I couldn't have one less than 12 inches long. And a lot of days in our fishing, we'd have 10,000 pound of great trout, and none of them were 12 inches long. Oh. And we were not even allowed to have them on the boat. Is that long netting? That was long netting. So that's, that's any kind of fishing that you have great trout. Mm -hmm. You can't even buy great trout in the market anymore. Yeah. So we had to quit. My net's in the barn, been there for 25 years. Hmm. Cost me about $15,000. It's useless. Well, that's a shame. That's the law. I find if the government touches it, it stinks. <laughs> Well, Mr. Meekins, can I ask you about a time that it was before your time, probably? And Nothing was before my time. I come over with my granddaddy, <laughs> Noah. <laughs> well, we're interested in the old freight boat routes. Do you remember, did freight boats ever come to Stumpy Point? Yeah, two come in here. Which ones? But, you know, I barely remember it. I just... Remember people talking about it. The Hattie Creef used to come here. I think the Hattie Creef is still around, but not not using. And the Hattie Creef bought fish. I know they came here in the winter time and bought a shad. And it belonged to the Globe Fish Company in Elizabeth City. The Globe Fish Company is no longer in business. I think Jeanette Brothers owns the property. That's a food purveyor. And he, he run every day from here to the Glue Fish Company in Elizabeth City. And we had another boat that came in here. I don't remember the name, and I don't remember much about the boat. 
I don't even know if I've ever even seen the boat. It went to Washington. Oh. And, uh, and they both carried the same thing, fish. So where did they tie up when they came in? They, they tied up to that fisherman's exchange. Oh, okay. They went right to his dock, loaded the fish on, and carried it back. They'd run the trip daily. So that was right up here by the bridge. Mm -hmm. Then did you say it was on this side of the bridge or the other side? It was on the other side. The south but side. But just barely on the other side. Okay. Like 50 yards on the other side. Okay. There was a canal there. Most of it's been filled up now, the canal. Mm -hmm. And then there was a bridge across the canal, a wooden bridge, that the owner of the fish house built. And across the bridge was a driveway about the side of this front yard where the truck could back up to the fish house and the fish house was built over the water. There's one or two pilots left standing there, oh. I think. And uh, I wish I had the picture. It's upstairs somewhere wherever my daughter hid it. Well, maybe we can get her to find it one day and look at it. So, do you remember what the Hattie Creef looked like? Do you have a memory of that boat? I think the Hattie Creef is still docked right by the, the bridge to Elizabeth City when you go from Camden to the city or past the Tank River. Oh. It was not a large boat, probably 50 or 55 feet long, 60 at the most. Had a house on the stern, a mast decked over, hole. They put the fish in the hole right in the middle of the boat. Probably out of six seventy one engine. I don't. I don't really know. Was there ice at the fishermen's exchange? They didn't make ice, and um, the first job I ever had. I was thirteen. I worked at the fishermen's exchange. We got our ice every morning. It came from Man's Harbor. The road was dirt. The truck was a red Rio truck. I don't know if they still make Rio's or not. And the ice plant was, when you first go into Man's Harbor on your right, I think they sell not much of nothing. Maybe grain, hunting license, something like that. It's just before you get to White. That was an ice plant. Yeah. He brought ice in here every morning. And that was in the summertime and we were packing pound net fish. That's the first thing we did ground up the ice. Now before that, I don't know where the ice came from. Well, I do too. About uh, about 75 years ago, we had an ice plant here. They made their ice. And it was farther back up the creek where that other fish house is. Mm -hmm. Got a sign that said Mm-hmm. It, that basin was, was smaller than just going out. On the east side of that canal was an ice plant. If there's anything there now. The Do basin had been dug out where the ice plant was. Now it's water. Do you remember the name of the ice plant? No, it wasn't in business when I come along, but it was the building was still there and it was tin. Tin roof, tin sides. Oh, it wasn't in business when you started becoming no. a commercial fisherman, you mean? No. It wasn't in business when I was a little boy. Oh, it wasn't? But it had been. Wow. Because when I was 13, we were getting our ice from Man's Harbor. And that place was out of business then. Okay. Wow. How about that? Yeah. So that goes way back. When I was a boy, is way back. <laughs> How did you used to bust the ice up? Well, they come in 300-pound three, blocks. We laid it on the floor. And we had ice ice pick. It was about uh, about 10 inches on the end. Had a long steel handle and the end like on the hoe end. It was about 10 by 6 and had 4 or 5 teeth in it where you could cut it up. And I, I cut my block of ice in half lengthwise and then cut the two pieces in four pieces. The other boy, he was about 17, he cut his in three pieces, 
he was larger than they, stronger than they, and he still is. And and we had to throw it up on his chute, and it went out of that room, it threw a hole down to the ice grinder to grind it up. One would throw it in, the other one on the outside would shove it up in a pile. The pieces he had weighed 100 pounds, the pieces I had weighed about 75. So it would get ground up to be in the fish hold? It'd be ground up in a bin about the size of that, twice as big as that couch. Mm -hmm. And right alongside the scales, when we packed the fish, we just shoved it on the fish. Mm -hmm. We'd grind up a truckload at a time to pack the pound net fish. But at that time, it went out of here on a truck. Okay. That was after the boat quit running. What were the fish boxes like? I have some in the barn. They were wood. They were heavy, weren't they? The, the, the box they weighed about 20 pounds. And they put a hundred pound of fish in them, and about forty or fifty pound of ice. You know the total weight about a hundred and sixty pound. And I was only thirteen. I could just lift one end of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the Globe Fish Company would come in and buy fish. Did any freight boat come in and bring? goods for the community and the they stores? They did, but that was before I come along. Mm -hmm. Okay. At, at my age, all of our grocers came in on a truck. They came across the ferry, across the and side. They come down here on a ferry or on a truck. And, and so did the gasoline. After I was about 15. Before that, all of our gas and diesel and kerosene came in on a boat. Wow. How about that? Where the Trinity Fish House is, when I was a boy, they had four big barrels. We didn't have electricity. The barrels were high enough, a truck could drive between the barrels and the water. And the fuel would flow down in the top of the truck. There are no pumps. <laughs> Just open the valve and here it come. When you got what you want, it close it off. That's the way they got the kerosene and the diesel fuel and the kerosene. Yeah. And that one man delivered it through the community. He put he carried it to your boat. He carried it to your house. A lot of people had barrels in front of their house. Mm -hmm. He put it in the barrels. And the way he measured it, he measured it in a five-gallon can. It didn't come in four gallons and, and eight-tenths. It came in whatever he put in his five-gallon can. If you wanted three gallons, he'd squirt you out three gallons. He'd look in his can when he loaded three gallons, he'd stop. And you paid for the three gallons. Do you remember his name? Yes, I do remember him. I remember very well. His name was, was Ed Midget. Cat may have been dead a right good while. He probably died when I was, he might have been dead 50 years. But a lot of his ancestors live here now. All, he had one daughter and three boys, they're all dead. But he had a lot of grandchildren. They're still around here. How Some about of them. Yeah, I don't know. Well, this is before your time too, probably. But did, did Stumpy Point ever get mail from the mail boat? Yes, they did. And my granddaddy was the uh, first postmaster. What was his name? His name was Irvin. Irvin Hooper. Ah. Oh. And where was the where was the post office? I don't know. He died when I was two. <laughs> he he been dead eighty years last Christmas Eve. Ah. Oh. But uh the next post office, the one I can remember was in the general merchandise store. In the back of the store, it was kind of a large building, and it had a, a row of mailboxes. And the postmaster's name then was George Hooper. And where was that store? That store was, um, that store had only been torn down about 15 or 20 years. It was not quite a mile down the road 
and the store was shoved down in a big old hole, and man, up for, just for the store. And he built a great big house. It's the largest house on the point. Have you ever been down the road? I will go after I leave here okay. and look. The largest house down there. It belongs to David and Karen Midget. So how did, when that store was there, how did the mail come? Uh, the mail come by, by road. By road? Yeah. Okay. They had a, had a dirt road to Man's Harbor. That was put there about uh, 75 years ago. I was a little boy when they built that road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when your grandfather was the postmaster, how did the mail come? It come by boat. Do you know the name of the boat? I don't know anything happened then. I was only two when he died. <laughs> Do you know where it came from? I guess it probably came from Man Hill. Just a guess. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be a good guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about the boat or the boat captain. I don't know anything about my granddaddy. Because I was only two. Mm -hmm. I know it's been a long time ago. It's a long time ago. Now, was there um, a connection between Stumpy Point and Hatteras Island? With the people? Well, three of my grandparents came from Rodanthe. Okay. I'm pretty original around here. Um, my granddaddy, the one the Meekin side, came here when he was six. He was the baby. And his father's name was William Hawkins Meekin. William Hawkins had a litter of children to Collington. Then he moved to Rodanthe and his wife died and he married a young woman. He was a smart man. <laughs> and and he had another litter of children and he moved them all to the point. And and I'm from that litter, the second litter. Ah. Oh. And the first litter, they all grew up in Collington. Some of them moved to Wong Cheese. You know, Ralph and Macon Meekins came from Collington to Wong Cheese. Do you know them? I don't. You missed out. They're both dead now, but they have children and grandchildren that live in Wong Cheese. I don't know if they know that we're kin or not, but we are. Why did they end up in Stumpy Point? Your people. I really can't imagine why they would come to Stumpy Point. There couldn't have been much here. But for the first quarter of a mile down here to the second ditch, all belonged to my great-granddaddy. He had three sons, and he cut it in three pieces, give it to those three sons. Now they're all dead, and all the people are gone, and there's no Meekins left. There's only two of us left on the point. Oh, really? There's a lot of them, but they're scattered everywhere. One of my cousins died in California. He has three or four children out there and a bunch of grandchildren. So who's the other Meekins? Do you know any Meekins? D Dickie Meekins. Oh. Uh, Dickie's about... I don't know how old Dickie is. Must be 50. And he's your kin? Yeah, he's my kin. Mm -hmm. He's um, His daddy and I were third cousins. I guess Dickie's my fourth. Okay. Dickie's mother's still living. She lives here. Myra. Oh. Do you know anybody here? I only know Sandy Ross. Sandy is just an implant. I know. Yeah. She's a good implant, though. Yeah. We have a lot of implants, and they're all good. Oh, well, that's nice. All that I know. Well, I just love people. Yeah. So you know, you're not going to get the bad report from me on people. Do you have any stories you'd like to share about growing up at Stumpy Point? Well, you know, I grew up in this bay like a fish. I learned to walk and swim at the same time. I tell them I'm, I'm part of this creek. I, um, when I when I was small, like eight, nine, ten years old, the little boy and I we would crab mornings, catch little soft crabs and feelers. Then we shove out to the back of the reef, and we'd fish till we got tired of fishing. Then we'd go swimming. And then when we got tired of swimming, we'd come to shore, but then it'd be lunchtime. Played baseball every afternoon. That's a good way to grow up.
It's a great way to grow up. And we had a great ball team. What was it called? It wasn't called. Just a team. <laughs> Seven points ball team. Man's Harbor had a good team. It was just Man's Harbor's ball team. Did you play Man's Harbor? I didn't play much after I got grown. After I reached puberty, I quit playing baseball. Yeah. I quit everything else. <laughs> I didn't know there was anything else. <laughs> Yeah, everybody has a different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I've been in love all my life. Aww. I've had five and a half mothers. That's a pretty good average. <laughs> I've been well kept. <laughs> That's a good average. My mother was a twin. Uh huh. And her twin didn't have any children. And her twin thought I was her boy too. Aww. And I thought she was my mother too. They were never separated one day in their whole life. Really? My mother died when she was 74. She had never missed a day being away from her twin. Did they live together? No. No, they didn't. But they didn't live far apart. And they moved in order during World War II. And they, and they moved the same day. And they just lived down the street from each other. And they moved back the same day. And Did... when I was six years old, my granddaddy had been dead three years. My grandmother moved in with us. Uh huh. She had raised 11 children, but they were all married. And she thought I was number 12. <laughs> and she treated me just like she did the 11. You're a lucky man. They gave me three mothers. And I never saw any difference in any one of the three. Now they're all three dead. I have two daughters. They both think they're my mother. <laughs> and they both treat me like my mother. My youngest son told me not long ago, I said, Daddy, you do like I tell you, we'll get along all right. <laughs> she owns this house, the youngest one. I have a little seafood business. The oldest one owns the seafood business. Uh -huh. So I just cut it up. I'm getting ready to move on, and they can add a house and the business. I, I won't be needing either one. That's nice. And then I have a half a mother. Who's that? That's Juanita Westcott over in Mania. Do you know Juanita? Nice. You've missed out. <laughs> She's a real special lady. Yeah. When I was 42, she and her husband come to my house. I had never seen either one of them before. My wife invited them over under the pretense of having dinner with us. But her real method was to have me born again. Oh. Because she was, and I wasn't. And she went to their prayer meeting every Friday night. I didn't go because I didn't pray much. I didn't need to go to a prayer meeting where everybody was praying, so I just didn't go. And she went to prayer meeting at Sunday point every Wednesday night. I didn't go there either, same reason. And when they came in the house, Juanita's husband said, after the introductory, are you saved? No. Do you want to be saved? No. Why don't you? I don't know. I did know. I lied. There was a little more sin I wanted to do down the road before I got saved. But I didn't tell him that. I tell you that. <laughs> and that night, after dinner, I thought, since I'm the host, they're all going to church. I'll go with them. So I went with them. And he spoke that night. I don't have a clue what he said. He only spoke about five minutes. They sang some song, prayed some, carried on, and I just kind of listened. And she sang two songs. She had a beautiful voice. She was a beautiful person. And she, uh, she sang, for those tears I cried, and the woman at the well. And that night when we come back about 10.30, you know, I was convicted that I probably need to be saved. Wayne said, we're going to have to go home now. It's about 10 to 3. Would you like to be saved? Yeah, I think I would. I sit at my kitchen table. I bowed my head. I asked Jesus to forgive me. He laid his hand on my shoulder and prayed. And she laid her hand on my shoulder and prayed. Then we walked through the doorway and sat on my couch. And Wayne said, are you saved? I said, yes, I am. And from then on, they were my best friends. Aww. 
and their children were my children's good friends. And Wayne died about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that left me with another mother. <laughs> She's my spiritual mother. That's beautiful. I call her every Mother's Day. Aww. I tell her that I'm the only man that has a mother 15 years younger than he is. <laughs> And she's a really beautiful person, and everybody knows her, loves her. That includes me. That is really nice. So I had five, plus a spiritual mom. Well, it sounds like you have led a blessed life. I have lived a charm life. Yes. Yeah, I really have. Now uh, I'm in my gray years. Yeah. I had a heart attack in October. Nobody in my family has ever had a heart condition. They die from various reasons, but no one ever had heart trouble. And on the way to Pitt and Greenville in an ambulance, I don't see you ever ride in one of their kind of ambulances. We hit a little bump and the enemy said, you're gonna die. And I said, praise the Lord. I was excited. <laughs> I thought, anything better than this? My chest hurt so bad. <laughs> you know, he thought he was scaring me. <clears throat> he was really raising my hopes. <laughs> but, you know, I lived. I made it on the pit. And I uh, had a good time in pit, but the food's terrible. Is it? But I recovered the heart attack. That's good. The doctor said, your heart's only pumping two-thirds of what it should pump. I told him, that's okay. I'm only working 5% what I used to work. <laughs> I'm doing what I say, and I don't get enough blood to my feet, and they're always cold. <laughs> yeah. Well, um... I grew up really nice. I had a lot of friends. Everybody here was my friend. They still are. Most of them are going. What's left are my friends. They're really close friends. That's... that's. I have great. good neighbors. When you, when you were growing up, um, did people ever go to Old Christmas in Red Anthony? Did you ever go? No, I had no way to go but swim. <laughs> Too far to Red Anthony. <laughs> My people all come from Red Anthony when they got here to stay here. Because I heard stories that uh, way back a long time ago, some people from Stumpy Point would go and then they'd get into a fight with people from Red Anthony at Old Christmas. Well, people from Red Anthony like to fight. I know a lot of them. <laughs> Some of them are my relatives, all of them are my friend. I knew Mac. Oh, did you? Everybody knew Mac. Yeah. Everybody loved Mac. Mm -hmm. He got more boots than anybody ever done for a county commissioner. Yeah, yep. They were afraid not to vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Asa Gregg. Do you know any of those people? I do. Yeah. Yeah, really nice people. Really nice people. I don't know his brother, Rudy. Uh-huh. Did they ever, did y'all ever have um, square dances when you were growing up? Not here. We didn't fight either. What did you do for musical entertainment? Well, we didn't have a lot of entertainment. We used to try to get our girlfriend off somewhere in a corner <laughs> and make our own entertainment. <laughs> you know, we had a little talk show down to the community builder a couple years ago. Another old codger like me. And uh, one of the ladies there, younger ladies, she's probably 45, that's younger. She said, what did you do for entertainment when you were growing up? The other man was Roger, Roger Best and I. I said, well, Roger's granddaddy and my granddaddy had 20 children. We just let it go with that. That's pretty good entertainment. <laughs> That's the number one entertainment in the world today. What's that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wouldn't you say? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. By far. Yeah. Well, that's always been our entertainment. Mm-hmm. 
one of my grandparents had 11 children, the other one had nine. So we know what people did in their spare time. They didn't have spare time. <laughs> well, Mr. Meekins, is there anything you'd like to add to this? this? Yes, I've enjoyed having you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I get lonesome here alone. <clears throat> I love people and your people. Yep. And I'm glad to have you. Well, I appreciate that. And before you leave, we'll have some chicken salad or barbecue. I have both. My daughter made both. Oh. She's my youngest mother. And she <laughs> made, she's a good cook. <laughs> and she asked me which one I wanted. And I said, yes, both. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'll turn this off now. But it has been a delightful interview.